that have gotten logged up for like intent or something like that, right? In states that are now transitioning into legalization and it's passed, would they be able to then make a case, okay, well, it's legal now, should I be able to leave? Well, their sentence can be commuted. If anybody is familiar with the um, the Manson murders from, uh, Char- I want to say Marilyn Manson, Charles Manson. So that was the Tate LaBianca murders of like the 60s, late 60s, 70s. And Charles Manson and his crew killed all these people. And at the time of their trial, the death penalty was in California. They were sentenced to death. And then a few years later, um, California changed its law and said, yeah, we're, we're just not going to do that anymore. And their sentences were commuted to life in prison. So the sentence could change. I don't have an exact answer. I haven't practiced criminal law on the wall. But I do know that there should be no ex post facto law. And that means Colorado, where marijuana is legal, if you carry marijuana and then the law becomes, um, I mean, the law goes to being illegal again, you wouldn't be able to be prosecuted for something that you did prior to. Now, let's make a distinction between state law and federal law. And that's, I'll bounce around today because I'm enjoying our, uh, what's going on in Black America. But the distinction between state and federal law is what we talk about when we talk about the power in our um, power and money dichotomy. So state law says marijuana legal, marijuana good. I think it's Oklahoma, California. Well, it's so many places now. However, federal law says it's still a crime. So if Texas was a marijuana free state, not free like as in it's free or you know it's free of, but if we were all in here smoking marijuana and the state officials came by, their thumbs up, they can't arrest anybody. However, if the DEA walked by or they did a raid, guess who's going to prison? Everybody, but probably not me. No, I'm kidding. But everybody can be rounded up, arrested, and taken to prison because of the supremacy clause. Is everybody familiar with or have heard of the supremacy clause? Okay. Is everybody familiar with the card game of spades? Somewhat. Okay. So everybody's familiar with the card game of spades. So the spades, just like in the four suits, you got your diamonds, you got your clubs, you got your hearts, and you got your spades. Playing this game, spades always trump the other cards. So. The Supremacy Clause pretty much says the spades, the federal law, will always trump state law so long as it is in line with the Constitution. What does that mean? So long as Congress has the power to make it, and then it will contra- I mean, not contradict, it will trump state law. So, for instance, the marijuana one is a really good example because we have about five to ten states that said marijuana is legal. That's fine. But federal law says, no, it ain't. It's still a schedule. I don't know what type of drug, but no, it's not. So you can get, well, I think Eric Holder, who's attorney general under President Obama, said, even though it's not legal under federal law, we will not use our resources to enforce it, meaning to arrest people. So um, that's probably the best example of state versus federal and the supremacy clause. Um, We'll try to wrap up class with the blackface governor and um, Liam Neeson, because they're about the same right now. But I'm going to go back to this lecture, because that was an excellent segue into state versus federal. So this is the review from the first two class lectures, the Mumbeck case, Quack Walker, Ex parte Somerset. Got our constitutional slavery amendments. Are they amendments? No. Yes, the constitutional slavery mentions, which is the Fugitive Slave Act, the Three-Fifths Compromise, and also the 1808 clause. Mind you, all of those are compromises. You just have to know what did the South win out of the compromises, what did the North win? And I abbreviate things. So FSA is Fugitive Slave Act, FSC, Fugitive Slave Clause, then I'll put 1808, and then I'll put three-fifths. Fugitive Slave Act and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. I'll spend five minutes on this. Does anybody need clarification on any of these cases or topics? So everybody's good to go. We know everything on it. I'm here to explain. Okay. So today's lecture is going to discuss 
acts and events leading up to the Civil War. So we've talked about uh, slavery in colonial times, which is our Mumbet, Pop Walker, Somerset cases. We talked about slavery under the US Constitution, which is the Constitutional Slavery Clauses, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. But I will write this because that was the last thing that I said about the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. This is my United States, okay? This is the North where there are generally free states. The South are generally slaveholding states. And then we have what's in green is gonna be considered the Northwest Territory. And under the Northwest Territory or the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, Congress, the federal government, not state government, Congress says whenever we acquire a new territory, because we want to make this big, large place, that territory has to be slave free, period. There was no question of what happens when that territory becomes a state. They just said, whatever, the territory would be free. But I asked last class period, what could happen or what would be the issue with that? And someone mentioned, what if they want to move to the Northwest Territory? What if somebody from Texas says it's too hot down here, I wanna to move to present day Illinois, which was Fort Snelling at the time. Then under Congress, you can't take your slaves. And so now I have to sell my slaves or leave them there or try to sneak them. So what happens if you sneak it? You, I don't know how you sneak slaves, but you, you sneak all your slaves to Illinois, present day Illinois. Since the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 is federal law, the federal troopers can come and round up your slaves. Much like if you have marijuana on you, the federal government, the DEA, can round up your, your um, weed, okay? So that's Northwest um, Territory, North, South, and pretty much the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. So I'm gonna go over a few um, keywords and then we'll discuss Prague versus Pennsylvania. So personal liberty laws. Starting with, I think it was Massachusetts in the Quack Walker Mumbet era of 1780, you have the states saying, okay, we don't really need slavery, so we're just going to abolish it. And so most of the 13 colonies by the time of the 1820s when the Underground Railroad came about, have abolished slavery. And so even though they have abolished slavery, we still have the Fugitive Slave Clause, which permits a slave master to recapture their slave. And so you have slaves going from the slave territory into the free north. And what those free north states did to circumvent the slave catchers coming is they created personal liberty laws. And that's what we'll see in Prig versus Pennsylvania. So pretty much personal liberty laws were state laws used to circumvent or weaken the Fugitive Slave Act. And I use slave act and slave law, or act and law are the same thing. I use them interchangeably. So under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, all you needed was an oath or affirmation to get your slave. Slaves could not testify. And there was a penalty of $500 if you were caught assisting slaves. So you think about what the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 did, and then think about how a state can weaken that law. So let's just put it into context like this. This is not the all of the requirements under the Immigration and Nationality Act, but let's just say Congress says, you have to be here in the state as a lawful permanent resident or green card holder for five years before becoming a United States citizen, right? Texas says, okay, that's good. But in order to be a Texas resident, and a United States citizen, you have to be here for 10 years. That would be 
something used to weaken the Immigration and Nationality Act because that state is requiring you do more and above than what Congress uh, requires. And so which law will trump, the state law or the federal law? And why do you think the state law? Right, they require more time. However, remember the supremacy clause. This is going to be the most important when we're talking about these cases. When we talk about this, Rachel versus Walker and Dred Scott versus Sanford. Remember my card game analogy. Federal law trumps state law. And here's the big if. So long as federal law is in line with the Constitution. That's really what the big argument is ever about. Whether Congress can make the law or whether the state can make the law. So in that analogy I gave about the Immigration and Nationality Act, Congress says you have to be here for five years before you can become a citizen, and Texas says 10 years, the federal law is going to trump because Congress has the power to deal with naturalization, to make laws regarding immigration. Texas doesn't have the power to make laws regarding immigration. Yes, sir? Uh, just in context of time, has the Supremacy Clause always been a part of the Constitution, or was it? Specific article four, or article six of the Constitution. Let me see. Yeah, so it was enacted in, in 1787 when uh, the Constitution was enacted. So Let me see. Article six. Yeah. Okay. So the Supremacy Clause was enacted at the same time of the Fugitive Slave Clause, the 1808 Clause, the Three Fifths Compromise, and so much like. The um, three fifth, I mean, not the three fifth, but the Fugitive Slave Clause say you can get your slaves, you can recover your slaves. Mm, your slaves. The clauses just tell you what to do, right? The laws tell you how to put them in place. Okay, so we have the Supremacy Clause, which means that federal law trumps state law so long as federal law is in line with the Constitution, meaning the Constitution must give Congress that right or the authority. So, under fugitive slave law, this is an ex this is a, a real life example of how state law would butt heads with federal law in the context of slavery. Under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, they say that all you need is an oath, I swear to God, that's my slave, or an affirmation. You write it down, you get it notarized, right? Let's just say the state of Massachusetts says, if you want to come pick up runaway slaves here, which you can, you need uh, an oath, two witnesses, and I don't know, some kind of like stamp of approval or something like that, some warranty deed. So why would that be undermining or weakening? Why would this Massachusetts law that I just made up be undermining or weakening the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793? Right. So that was the big question in Prig versus Pennsylvania. Not just you have to do more work, but yes, you undermine or you, it's, it's, it's contradicting the law. The law just tells you you have to do the bare minimum. The law tells you you have to just show up and say, that's my slave. But Massachusetts was saying, no, you got to do X, Y, and Z. You got to show up, say, that's my slave. You got to have two witnesses with you, et cetera, et cetera. So it undermined or it weakened the law. So that's one example. Um, so personal liberty laws were started right after the Underground Railroad, right when you have this mass exodus of people wanting to help runaway slaves. Who thought the Underground Railroad was the actual railroad? Just raise your hand if you thought it was a child. <laughs> As a child, maybe like up until third or fourth grade. I admit it, okay? You guys have the internet now. We didn't have the internet back then, so. Okay, so um, personal liberty laws kind of came when the Underground Railroad emerged 
um, 1820s. And so there's a mass exodus of slaves going to the north. So the um, southerners are like, look, I know that we can go and get my, our slaves because this law tells us we can, but these northern states are requiring us to do more. So next session of Congress, we need to go and we need to let them know that you need to strengthen this Fugitive Slave Act. So what do they do? They strengthen the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So instead of oath and affirmation, that's still there. You can still do the same oath and affirmation. Slaves still cannot testify. But you have to have an incentive to make people follow the law, right? Because it wasn't necessarily about, you know, you locating your slave. It's about you actually being able to obtain your slave. So in order to make people comport with this, they said, okay, we're going to make the federal marshals uh, be part of the capturing of slaves. Not just the personal people, not just the people we hire, like uh, Prick, what was his name, uh, Prick, to go get our slaves. We're going to say the government is involved. Our government officials are involved with capturing slaves. So now we have the U.S. Marshals adding that to their bucket list of job requirements. And the thing about the Marshals is, if the Marshals didn't comply, they were fined $1,000, which is the equivalent of approximately $30,000 in 2019. So if you see that slave and your bleeding heart as a U.S. Marshal won't capture that slave, $30,000 fine. But the incentive to capture a slave is you get bonuses. If you were just a regular person, we'll put them on, as we we'll call them a Quaker or abolitionist. And you assist, see, there's a difference. The U.S. Marshals would get fined for turning the other way, for not assisting. But if you were a Quaker or abolitionist and you assisted in uh, derailing the government or derailing the personal slave catcher from getting a slave, you were sentenced to prison for six months and you were slapped with a thousand dollar fine. The punishment was harsher. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 pretty much came out of the Compromise of 1850. Oh, how did I miss the Missouri Compromise? Okay, came, came out of the Missouri. I mean, the Compromise of 1850, which says California is admitted as a free state. But it also mandated that the U.S. Marshals capture slaves. I'm going to backtrack right quick to something that's extremely important, but I already have my U.S. map up, so it makes it easier. This line right here is an imaginary line. It's called the 36-30 parallel, and that was the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise did two things. The Missouri Compromise of 1820. I knew I kept saying 1820 for a reason. Number one, this little imaginary line right here, which the state of Missouri sat above it, said that there will be no slavery. This is a Congress, a congressional law, federal. No slavery above that red line. I don't care what y'all do under the red line, but no slavery above the 3630 parallel. And then the second thing it did was it admitted whoa, Missouri as a slave state. So that's Missouri slave. And then it admitted Maine as a free state. That's an exam question. And I like to trick people up 
because I'll say something like, Missouri was admitted as a free state and Kentucky was admitted as a slave state. So know the state that it admitted as a free state, know the state that it admitted as a slave state. The big thing about doing two and two like that, which is one slave, one free, is because now, I believe it was 13 and 13 at this time, it made 13 slave states, 13 free states, and so the country felt that they were even. But as you know, the slave states had a greater population, so they had more representation in the house. So that's 1820. Now getting to our case of the day. Can somebody tell me what the issue was in Creek versus Pennsylvania? Or what are the facts of the case? Anybody? Mm -hmm. And who was Margaret Morgan? She was a slave. She was a black woman. Uh, was Maryland a slave state or a free state? Talk a little bit louder for me. So, so Pennsylvania was a free state. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Um, she was given virtually like full freedom, but she was like not officially emancipated. So her, I forgot who, but they said they wanted her back. So they sent a Prince to go get her, and then he was like. And who was Prince? Okay. So, Margaret was a slave who was born in Maryland to John Ashmore. And I don't know how, but at some point she moved from Maryland, a slave state, to Pennsylvania, which is a free state. She lived as a free woman, but of course, like most of these stories, no one ever gets emancipated voluntarily. And so, John Ashmore, who's the slave master, dies. And like most of these stories, the heirs say, oh, okay, no, we want you to come back. So, they don't request that she come back. They hire someone by the name of Edward Pree. He's a known slave catcher. I made that up, but obviously that's why they hired Pree. They hire Pree to recapture uh, Margaret. And so they walk over to Pennsylvania. They grab Margaret. They grab her children, some of who were not born in slavery. So they were born in Pennsylvania in the free state. And they sell them. And so I guess before they can leave, Margaret somehow gets into court and Mr. Prig and his posse are arrested and they are charged under two laws. Both these Pennsylvania laws are considered personal liberty laws. Why? Because they were used to weaken the Fugitive Slave Act. The Pennsylvania law of 1788 just straight up said, you cannot retrieve slaves. How do you have a law like that when this law tells you you can get your slaves back and this is how you get them? Pennsylvania said, we don't recognize slavery here. You can't get slaves here. That's their first law. Five years later, they said, not only can you not get slaves, but if you try to relate, retrieve these slaves or a lot of persons, then it will be a felony. So not only can you, are you prohibited from doing it, you are risking fine or jail time. So um, Prig gets Miss um, Margaret by force, obviously, nobody willingly goes. And he and his posse are charged under the Pennsylvania law of 1788 and 1793. The reason why I underlined and put asterisk on these laws is because the Constitution was passed in 1787. So you have your federal law first, or your federal clause, saying you have the right to get your slaves. Then Pennsylvania passed the law a year later saying, no, you don't. And then the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 came out 
a few years later after the Constitution saying, this is how you get your slaves. Pennsylvania said, no, you can't. So Pennsylvania was always coming after the federal government, weakening that law by either restricting it or creating uh, punishment for if you do it the federal government way. So that's the rule of law in this case. Remember I told you about Iraq issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. So the issue is, well, actually these are the facts. The issue is supremacy clause or federal law versus these law, which is state law. And so the analysis of this case is how did the court come to their decision? The question before the court was which one trumps, the supremacy or the Pennsylvania law? And so you go to the supremacy clause that says federal law trumps state law so long as federal law is in line with the Constitution, meaning that the Constitution must give Congress the authority. Does the Constitution give Congress the authority to create any kind of slavery clauses? Yes, the Fugitive Slave Clause. Is this law um, in line with that clause or with the Constitution? Well, the Fugitive Slave Act or Fugitive Slave Law, whatever you want to call it, is in line with the clause that gave it the power. The clause gives you the right, the, uh, the act or the law gives you the power, the mechanism for how to do it. So it will trump. Pennsylvania's law of 1788 that cannot restrict slaves was struck down because it violates the um, Supreme, I mean, the Fugitive Slave Act. And also the Pennsylvania law of 1793 that made it a felony if you take a slave by force was struck down because nowhere in the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 does it talk about treating slaves gently when you take them, nor does it have any kind of punishments for those that assist with slavery. There's only a punishment or a penalty for those who uh, seek to prohibit people from taking their slaves. So the Supreme Court said, in Pre versus Pennsylvania, sorry, Margaret, that you have to go back. I don't know what happened to Margaret's children. I'm assuming that they stayed sold. I'm assuming that the free person was sold as well, and he stayed into slavery until things changed, if he was still alive. But um, because remember, we talked about what happens when you have this future slave law that allowed you know, slave catchers to go get their property. A lot of free blacks, God bless you, a lot of free blacks became um, enslaved like Solomon Northrop because slave catchers were given that authority and they only had to show minimal effort of their property. So that's it for today's lecture. That's a lot of information. I am sticking around for questions, comments, concerns. I'm gonna let um, Jasmine speak to, well, no, I'll actually put it out in an email, but does anybody have any questions about this? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, that circle with the slash is no. I saw that somewhere, but that's why I know it means no or not. Slaves could not testify. Next week will be Rachel versus Walker and Dred Scott versus Sanford, and I will deliver the worst decision in United States history and the worst line which stated that and it's, in, it's in the Supreme Court uh, their book of records that persons of African descent will never become citizens of the United States so that's still on the books so I just have a question because someone posed this uh, to me the other week can someone Okay, not the Liam Neeson, but the govern the governor thing. Everybody familiar with is it the Virginia governor or someone in blackface? Is there ever a chance for rehabilitation in this society for something that was done 20, 30 years ago? Like or Let's just say person wise, the choices. Why not? Because I feel like if that was your energy 30, 40 years ago, don't let people's like, like hate on you change that. Like that was just how you felt, so feel like that. So you're saying it's permissible for him to still feel like that because that is who you are? Yeah, yeah. okay. Did you have a comment? I saw somewhere the picture from high school, then I saw somewhere that it was from medical, medical school. school. Yeah, you're about 26, 27 when you go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, I think everybody's a consensus that it's wrong, but is there a chance to rehabilitate? Oh, you've grown. I still never accepted when people been younger. Maybe I would say he grew up 
but like time changed, you know, but like that was a pretty old act. Like you old enough to know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are stuck in their ways. Mm -hmm. Like if you like our like our grandparents, they're set in the stuck ways from like how they grew up. Like you can't just change that overnight. So they knew like that. I'd rather him stay like that than give me a a fake face and have that black face in the back of his head. Well, can he be redeemed for saying that this is how I grew up, this is all I know, but as I got older, I'm not finished with his statement, if I was his press secretary, this is how I grew up, this is what I know, but as I got older, I became more tolerant, I became more inclusive. There's Can he really, say that? Really be genuine, true. and then... It is genuine. He said he was trying to be Michael Jackson, but he learned how to moonwalk. Well, that's because he had a bad publicist saying this stuff. <laughs> but what I'm saying, if he, if he kept, I don't want to say kept it real, but let me let me just address a cultural thing in the black community. Uh, if my black students are familiar with this, what happens in this house stays in this house. We don't speak about this. I was reading. I mean, I was watching an interview, listening. Cause I was driving. I wasn't watching it, but I was listening to an interview um, yesterday where they asked the comedian actress Monique about the R. Kelly situation, and then she she brought that up. How in the black community? I mean, this has been known about R. Kelly forever. I, I've known about it for. I've heard about it, known about it for 15 years. But in the black community, there is this thing of what happens in this house, you don't, you leave it in this house, whether, not even say whether good or bad, or good, bad stuff, you don't let people in your business. So if that's how people are taught, and then they grow older, and they realize, okay, you know, maybe that's not such a good thing, can it not happen for other people in their mistakes? Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is, it, that, and that's what I want to know, especially in this generation where there is trial by public opinion like no other. I could not have grown up on social media. Is there a chance for rehabilitation? Do we like Harry, Prince Harry, or do we not care? Let's just say we 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 have an opinion. Do we? Do how do we feel about Prince Harry? You know, Prince Harry had a swastika on his arm. So you know, I just I, I'm wondering about rehabilitation in this society because I'm going to assume that most of you guys are maybe 23, 24 years and younger. So all you know is a social media life or not saying that you're on there, but all you know is a life where the internet is out there and et cetera, et cetera. And if you get to people that are maybe 30 something and above, one thing we will say is, whoo, I'm so glad that you know social media wasn't around when we were in high school and things like that. Because, like, go ahead. I feel like it's different for us too because like, I feel like we got the, the, the end of both. Like, we got the end of playing outside, yeah. not having the phone. Y'all played outside? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Like, okay. memorize people's numbers. Like, we grew up on that, and then we got, we were like the guinea pigs of technology. Like, we were the very first, like, hey, let's try this on them and see if it works. But the generations, like, under us, a little younger, that's all they know. Like, it's it's different. Like, we're talking about boondocks coming back. Or, uh, it's like, that show? Yeah, it's all like that. But, like, it's not going to be the same because how we will laugh at that, society will eat that up and be like, no, that's not acceptable. It's not culture or something like that, you know? But for us, it was all jokes. Like, it, it wasn't as sensitive. So, I feel like we got to experience something like of both ends. Like, all right, we understand what life is for like this, and then we also understand like what it is to always have a phone in our hand, you know? This, this is the last question I'll leave you guys with, because when I introduced this class, you know, I told you that slavery was more than just about, okay, well, you know, there's a human that doesn't look like me, um, so let me enslave them. It was about money, and it was about power. And if you were raised in, I, I try to get you guys not to sympathize, but to look at it from a slave master's position, like this is property. This is why I don't say African Americans. This is why I continuously use the word slave because that's what they were. You might as well just you know exchange it with the word shoe, 
or television because they were considered property. And so if that's all you know, if you are a child growing up in slavery, a, a Caucasian child, and all you know is, you know, the older black woman to be mammy and things like that, is there a chance for rehabilitation if you come from that ancestral lineage? So can the can the governor have a chance at redeeming himself if he throw himself on the sword, so to speak? No. no. How do <laughs> slave people? Wait. Okay. No. 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 Keep keep your opinion. I just really want you guys to think about that because I think we are so quick to just you know judge and say, oh, blackface. That's horrible. It is horrible. The picture actually was very horrible. But you have to understand that that's all some people know. Some people probably have never even seen black people. They have been rooted with this type of personality. And so if at some point in their life they meet black people or they are exposed to these things, I mean, we're assuming that, the governor aside, but we're assuming that these people see black people every day. There are some counties where there are no black people at all. So I was one of nine black students in my law school class at LSU. The entire, I'm sorry, yeah, the class. And that's one of... 13 black law students in the entire student body at LSU Law. And that was just 10 years ago. So, yes. My opinion is that, I mean, ignorance isn't an excuse anymore. Like, we're such an open world that if you want to learn something, you can learn it. Anymore. But what about 30 years ago? Yeah, that resurfaced. Yeah, but he's not addressing it like he should. Like, right now, you know, like, it's only coming up because, oh, somebody posted it or something. Yeah. And even worse than the governor, I'm more concerned about the attorney general just came out and said, oh, I was doing that stuff too. Oh, the attorney general? I know it's like three people that got some so issues going on in the state. And some sexual Is that the black guy? Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. But I know the attorney general. I the top the three people of that state are embroiled exactly. in scandal. So, yes, ma'am? I was just going to say, I think it's a chance for re rehabilitation, but I never think I want people who ever had to use at any point in their life to have a position of power. That's a good point. Okay, so I have an extra credit assignment for you guys. It'll be one point on your final grade because I'm, I'm very interested for this because there are two different opinions. Uh, just a small paragraph as if you were blackface governor. I don't know his name. I shouldn't call him that. But if, <laughs> if you were his press secretary, write a release, a press release redeeming this man from his blackface. And if you are just staunchly opposed to the blackface governor and saying that there is no redemption, write a response to, like imagine what the press release would be for somebody trying to defend it. They are they admitting it and they're taking responsibility for it, but write a uh, your response to that press release saying pretty much, nah, we ain't letting you slide, okay? So extra credit, you get one point on your final grade. What does that mean? If you are sitting on an 89 in my class at the end of the semester, that goes from a B plus to a 90, which is an A minus because I am on plus minus system. But that goes from a 3.3 .3 to a 3.67. So um, I'll get your comment. There was two students who needed a syllabus. I have the hard copy here after class, but I'll repeat again the extra credit. Um, you have two sides. Number one, pretend you are the publicist for Governor Blackface. He's never made a statement yet. He didn't say it was me, it wasn't me. You just know that this is about to hit the airways in 24 hours. Make a statement that would redeem him, okay? And then on the other side is if you're just like, there's just no way, no way in hell I can redeem this man, make a statement responding to the people who would try to take responsibility. He's gonna take responsibility in his statement, so you know, make it good. There's one point for that. I'll give another point if you actually read your statement and debate it next class, so. So we just pick on one side, right? Yeah, because then, yeah, pick one side. Whether you want to write the redeeming statement for him or whether you want to write the statement that will respond to somebody trying to redeem him. Like, if I'm saying, if I'm, I'm going to redeem him, I'm going to say, you know what? Governor Blackface was in a county of uh, 2,000 people. All of them were white in Mississippi. Um, his, he's the third generation of slaves. I'm saying all this not to excuse his behavior, but to say that there are cultural differences and it wasn't until he started his first job in a rural county and then he met his first black client that, you know, he really understood what slavery meant and what the hard times, you know, 
that's how I'm going to redeem it. So think about kind of like what I said and think about, you'd be like, nah, that's not good enough. He should have known better. Or, you know, like your colleague said, age 27 is uh, enough time to know you're, you're grown. So, I mean, you may not have had Google in 1986, but you could have found out what was going on. You know, you're not ignorant to the laws that have been passed. So, yes, sir. Next slide, Spirit. Which is, you know, you just let me know. I see it and I'll read it. You can type it, you can write it. Make sure your writing is legible if you write it though. So, and that's it. All right, thank you guys. I will see you next week. Next week I'll keep it short and sweet because it's Valentine's Day. Y'all right, got that short and sweet? No. Okay. <laughs>